there are some pretty boring places where pretty exciting things are happening. And I'm going to talk to you today about the warehouse because I really believe that the warehouse is ground zero for industry 4.0. And so let's talk about that a little bit. Let me just give you a little bit of history on the company. Uh, we got our start in a warehouse, a company called Quiet Logistics. What Quiet Logistics does is Quiet Logistics fulfills e-commerce orders that are placed online. And the whole premise of Quiet Logistics was that people were going to be able to get their stuff faster if only we could automate the warehouse. And so we started putting robotics in place. So I'll give you a little bit of history on that. Got to talk a little bit about what's happening in the world of retail, talk a little bit about e-commerce, and just give you some views on that. So if we look at this timeline, as I mentioned, we started Quiet Logistics back in 2009 with, the, with an idea that said, we're going to be able to fulfill e-commerce orders faster if we can do it through automation, namely robots. A company locally here called Kiva, Logis called Kiva Robotics, we, put, uh, we constructed a warehouse, put Kiva robots in it, and lo and behold, we were able to improve the productivity of warehouse pickers 3x. That was great, right up until Amazon bought Kiva and decided they were going to take all their marbles and go home, and they weren't going to let anybody else use their robots. So now we're stuck with a warehouse that had customers, merchants in our warehouse where we were fulfilling their orders. We needed a way to get the, the orders out the door. We started to embark on a search to find the perfect robot to do this, and decided there really wasn't a perfect robot to do this, so we decided to build our own. I always sort of think of the JFK line, which is, you know, we're not really heroes, but they sunk our boat. Um, we've just started to ship our robots. We have eight installations uh, here in, in North America. We've just announced that DHL is doing a deployment with our, with our robots, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why this is necessary. Um, anybody been in a mall lately? Okay, yeah. If you had been in a mall, you'd see that because you don't go into a mall, mall stores are just going out of business left and right. You're seeing a lot of empty spaces in malls. And the reason for that is that e-commerce is starting to replace the traditional retail shopping, which you already know. So e-commerce has achieved critical mass, but it's still only a tiny fraction of the total retail market worldwide. But what's happened is, E-commerce has pushed the responsibility for picking items off a shelf upstream to the warehouse. It used to be merchants, retailers could use all of us consumers to do their work for them. You'd walk into a retail store, you'd see what you wanted, you pull it off the shelf, you put it in your cart, you take it to the checkout, sometimes you even do self-checkout like places, at places like Lowe's. So that the responsibility for doing a lot of that hard work falls onto the consumer. But now when you place an e-commerce order, the responsibility for picking and packing that order goes upstream to the merchant. We've got a lot of disruptive change on this, and I'm going to kind of fly through this slide here, which just basically says at Quiet Logistics, we have four warehouses, about a million square feet that we ship stuff out of. But let's talk about what that really means to, to people out there. If we look at the retail market worldwide, it's about 22 trillion, trillion with a T dollars. And only about 7% of that market is done in e-commerce. So there is a big chunk that still humans walking into stores, consumers walking into stores, picking things off the shelves and putting them in their carts and walking out. What we're seeing is not only is the total global market for commerce for for retail growing, it's growing to about 30 trillion dollars in the next 5 years, but we're also seeing the slice of the pie that e-commerce represents growing within that overall pie. So what's happening is, as retail shrinks, traditional retail shrinks, we're seeing e-commerce pick up the slack. So it's kind of a Pac-Man effect, where e-commerce is eating retail's lunch. And it will start to, you know, it will continue to become a larger and larger portion of the pie. Just to give you some perspective on this, we all think of Amazon as a behemoth, and it is but it only represents $100 billion in that $22 trillion market. So in fact, it doesn't even register on this pie chart. Neither does Alibaba, neither does, does Jet. They're all tiny, tiny things in the, in the global uh, retail marketplace. 
So if we think about e-commerce, we're all familiar with the shopping cart. We all do it. What most people don't think about is what happens after the click. You know, we all know the part about where you get in the shopping cart, you put your items in, you select it, you give your credit card, and then magically things appear at your door. Well, behind the magic is this very boring place, the warehouse. Warehouses used to look inside like this. They were big crates on pallets. And it really only needed a few people with a fork truck and some weight belts, although those exoskeleton things are pretty awesome, and I'm sure that they would love to have them. It only needed a few guys with a fork truck to be able to get merchandise in bulk packages out to distribution centers or retail stores. But today, the inside of a warehouse looks like this. It's individual bins, thousands and thousands of individual bins containing single items that have to be picked by hand one at a time to be put in a box and shipped out to the end user, to consumers, instead of to distribution centers and stores. So it now requires this small army of people to go and pick these items in the warehouse. We call this piece picking thing each picking. These, these folks are in there picking eaches, it's called. And then there's been this Amazon effect. So in addition to people wanting to get their stuff, they want it gift wrapped. They want it in two days, or one day, or two hours. So there are all kinds of special treatments that are happening with e-commerce picking, which means that while you would expect the labor demand curve to mirror the growth in e-commerce, in fact, the curve is a lot steeper than that because we have all these special services that are layered onto the orders that people are picking, which means that your small army just became a larger army of people needed to do this. And what that means is, that it's really labor, which is the raw material of e-commerce. People don't really realize this, but the raw material is humans in the warehouse picking the stuff that, that arrives on their doorstep, doorstep two days later. And while you might have heard that people are out of work around the country, in the warehouse space, we can't find people fast enough. The, the big challenge that exists in the warehouse is that labor costs are rising, and people are very hard to find. And oh, by the way, as Amanda indicated, the work is pretty hard. People have to pick up boxes a thousand times a day. Sometimes they're little things that go into box, but sometimes they're you know, good sized things. If you're gonna order that, uh, you know, those speakers, those stereo speakers, they could be pretty big to go into the carts to get out to the consumer. So this is the real challenge. Finding labor and retaining labor in these spaces, and it can be very cyclical too. So for instance, in our quiet warehouses, we hire every October, we hire an additional 800 employees. And then we lay most of them off. We lay off 700 of them the following February. So it's a very cyclical business. So if we look at how the piece picking evolution has gone through in the warehouse, we start with <clears throat> excuse me, what we call RF cart picking. This is basically handing someone a shopping cart in this case, it's a shopping cart that's fitted out to look like a dozen shopping carts. There are bins put on these things. They're tall baker's racks, they're a little taller than I am, which doesn't mean they have to be tall, I'm kind of short. But anyway, they're, they're tall racks on wheels that people push through there, and they pick a dozen or 15 orders into each of these, and they push these carts through the warehouse, and they snake through all different parts of the warehouse to get the items for their order. And that's been around since e-commerce began in the mid-90s. <clears throat> then we had this Kiva revolution, around 2003, which is what we call goods to person, where instead of the people walking and pushing carts through the warehouse, the, the warehouse racks actually come to the human being who's standing at a picking station. The racks actually move through the warehouse to the human being. The human picks an item off the, car, off the rack, <clears throat> puts it in a bin, and then the robots return the racks to, the place, to their places in the warehouse. And now we have autonomous mobile robots. This is what we do here at Locus. We have these robots that move by themselves through the warehouse, and if you think of them as self-driving cars, think of them as Teslas that move through a warehouse, but instead of carrying people, they're carrying merchandise in the warehouse. The interesting thing about these technologies is still at this very moment, Almost all of the warehouses, all, almost all of the warehouse picking is still done with humans dragging these baker's racks around. And the tiny percentage of warehouses that are using these Kiva goods-to-person robots 
are virtually all, at least domestically, in Amazon's warehouses. Amazon took those robots in, in for themselves. And so you can't get them anymore. So people are looking for, warehouse operators are looking for a solution to be able to get their goods out the door. So how does this work? If you think about a typical e-commerce scenario, you have, these are all things you've probably done. We have the back to school thing, which is where you can have penny loafers in the same package as, as spiral bound notebooks. There's no relationship <clears throat> between these things in the warehouse, where they may live in the warehouse. They could be thousands of, you know, hundreds of feet apart, but they go into the same order. Office supplies, um, clothing orders, whatever. So all these items, when you want to go and place the order, the items are scattered throughout the warehouse. And typically, a human being would have to drag a cart all the way through the warehouse to get, for instance, the items in blue that fill an order. The person will have to walk through the entire warehouse. But now what we do with our autonomous mobile robots is we divide the warehouse up into zones, and we say, hey, humans, don't walk through the whole warehouse. Stay in your zone. Just stay there in the zone, and we're going to send a robot out to you. The robot is going to request the merchandise. You simply put it into the robot's bin, and then the robot will take it away, and you stay where you are. You can be master of your domain in that zone. So a path through the warehouse that to, get that, to pick that blue order would look like that, but that's the robot doing all the working, all the walking. And here's a little video to show you how that happens. The robots are equipped with tablets, and the tablets display the item and the location that the worker is to pick when it gets the, to the location of the warehouse. The, um, the on-screen display can change languages if the warehouse worker doesn't speak English, and it's designed for both speed of throughput as well as ease of use. The worker does not follow the robot. The robot moves completely autonomously. It's not controlled by anything other than its own sensors and its desire, its innate desire to get to its goal. So worker A will put an item in the bin. The, the robot will then proceed to wherever the next item is, which could be in a different zone manned by a different worker. And so we have this many-to-many -many relationship between workers and robots. The robots will avoid obstacles, whether they're permanent infrastructure or temporary, whether they be other, other robots, humans, or just merchandise that's been dumped at the end of, a, of an aisle in the warehouse. So I said, it's just like being in a self-driving car. It's just that it's the merchandise that goes for the ride, not the human. And what we say here is robots empowering people. And I really loved Amanda's message of the exoskeletons. Because what we're doing here is we're not so much trying to replace people. We're trying to make people much more effective in how they get this job done. It's still, human beings are still best at having the dexterity to pick individual items off of, off of a shelf. Small cosmetic items, toys, office supplies. Humans are still best at that motion. But the robot is best at doing the traveling and the carrying. So if we take a look at some predictions, which, uh, you know, Probably, who knows how far these will go. Um, think back to 1970, a gentleman by the name Masahiro Mori put together a chart called the Uncanny Valley, in which he postulated that people are really creeped out by humanoid-looking robots, that the closer to human-looking a robot gets, the more distasteful it is to humans. It's sort of a you know, a, a, um, a, th this notion that robots are going to take over our lives, it's, it's um, that, that, that people are okay with moving objects as long as they don't try to emulate a human. So in 1970, humanoid robots were scary. Our robots are not humanoid robots, but they're not not human because we think they're scary. We make them not human because we're trying to make them functional. Our objective is to build sensors and tools into a robot that's actually functional today. We're not going for um, sexy, we're going for functional. But today, of course, humanoid robots are our friends. Ever since Rosie came on the scene in the Jetsons, and wouldn't we all still love to have Rosie, um, and C-3PO, and even when we get to, to robots from Transformers movies, robots have all of a sudden become our friends. So predictions that were made back in 1970 are really not so effective today. And so the predictions that I make here are probably not going to be as, so effective even in 2019. 
Um, but what we're looking at today is our robots are really at the intersection of a few different emerging trends, very important trends. Obviously, they're robots. So they're at the intersection of robotics, e-commerce, which is the problem that we're solving. One of our premises is that you can't just build robots for robots' sake. You actually have to have an end in mind. We picked a $22 trillion market. We figured that was probably good enough to allow us some headroom to, to um, make money off these things. Uh, and we decided to build a robot that was purpose-built for the warehouse picking case. And Amanda, you and I will probably have to talk later because I think Lowe's would be a great opportunity for them. Um, Internet of Things, of course, many of you are familiar with them. Uh, our robots are equipped with a multitude of sensors, and of course, sensor technology is evolving and improving all the time. And one of the things that's really critically important is making sure that we're building a layer into our robots, not just to house the sensors, but multi-layers so we can change out a sensor at any time as the technology continues to improve, as cameras continue to improve, as LiDAR continues to improve, and that what we're doing is we're aggregating the input from all of these different sensors and coming up with a decision-making algorithm that allows the robots to decide whether to go left, right, whether to avoid something or wait patiently for something. And that, of course, brings us to the AI and machine learning. The robots, when they're, when they're operating within a warehouse in a multi-robot environment, are essentially acting in a crowdsourcing way, um, sort of like ways for warehouses. If a robot in aisle three sees an obstruction, a robot in aisle seven will know about that obstruction. As the robots continue to pass that obstruction, just like in Waze, if you see that there's a police car up ahead, if the police car is noticed multiple times over a period of days by multiple drivers, Waze will upgrade that police car, that casual police car, to a speed trap. Our robots will, over time, as they notice a, what they first perceive as a temporary obstruction, like another pallet that's been dropped at the end of an aisle. The robots will continue to confirm the presence of that pallet at the end of the aisle. They'll communicate it with one another, and over a period of time, they will upgrade that to permanent infrastructure. So they're constantly learning and sharing this information among themselves. And this is happening today in warehouses. This is not, this is not magical, fantastical stuff of the future. So I'm going to come back to what I said earlier, which is, I believe the warehouse really is ground zero for Industry 4.0. If we look at all the components of Industry 4.0, which is being able to integrate various systems and doing the augmented reality that, that Amanda was referring to, and taking a look at things like um, the Internet of Things and, and, and robotics, warehouses are not just big dumb boxes that hold stuff. Warehouses are actually dynamic, ever-changing environments, which are really the smart engines that are powering our economy in the form of delivering things out to the retail customer. As we look at some of the challenges, some of these we've solved, but of course you can always solve them better. Uh, we announced recently what we call LRAN, which is a new form of, of robotics navigation. Um, you've got to basically accomplish what's effectively indoor GPS. The robot has to know where it is. It has to know where other things are, including other robots, people, ladders, fork trucks. And it has to practice this obstacle avoidance in a way that's safe for interacting with humans. These are collaborative robots. They're designed to work with humans. Um, obviously, being able to get to an ROI on this is very important in order for this to be a commercial success, and we're starting to see that in action today. Yes, sure, all businesses start as land grabs, but we're moving into commercial viability now. Um, and things like battery technology, power usage, and so forth. And of course, paramount among all these things is safety. Our robots weigh just 100 pounds. They can carry a payload of an additional 100 pounds. They don't hit you, but if they were to bump into you or you to them, it's like bumping into an eight-year-old. Retail. We started there. We're going to kind of end there. It's not really dead, it's just being reborn in another form. So this is like invasion of the retail body snatchers. Um, we're seeing this transformation, and again, coming back to the ROI on this, we need to make sure that you know, what retail has done to date is they've put things with reasonable margins, are making good money for, for e-commerce. Other things that are going out in e-commerce tend to be loss leaders. It's still a land grab in the world of Amazon. They're not making money when they deliver something to you in two hours. But they will 
make money when they can control the market as they are doing today um, in terms of the big data that they're collecting about your preferences and being able to offer you upgrades to Amazon Video and Amazon Prime and all, Prime and all of those other things. And other retailers are working very hard to keep up and they need the, the technology and the ability to be able to do that. Humans are still good at a lot of different things that robots are not good at. The idea here is really that we marry the best of the people with the best of the robots and make sure that we're getting really empowered people. We're not doing bionics with exoskeletons. We're doing bionics by making sure that the robots are taking the hard work off the humans and allowing the humans to do what they're best at. Thanks. <laughs>